so interesting and enlightening conversations I've had with the wealthy and the marginal and strange places one goes in life. The other side of this whole time thing is the, the people who are trapped trapped in sort of a, the present past. They're, both, they're in the present and the past. Their past and their present are kind of blurred and that are very stuck. These are the people that 50 Cent was working so hard to distance himself from and get away from the um, the mindset that this kept kind of drawing people into these dysfunctional relationships with the present and the past. So, yeah, you have a relationship with time. In a sense, when we're looking at the, the newer, more improved way of approaching the timeline, it's. I, th I think the distinction we have to make is our relationship to time. What is our relationship to the distant future, the near future, the present, the expanded present, the near past, the distant past? And people have very, very different relationships with these places all at once. Um, I've seen crippling relationships with time. People, and I've seen a lot of that too. I've seen a lot of that where people have, have a... a they're imprisoned in the present, or they're imprisoned in the past. They're um, not capable of really moving toward the future. I, they are capable of it. I would say, yes, they're capable of it, but they have been so socialized. I think the right term here is socialized. Socialized into a certain relationship with the present or the past, that moving toward the future or letting go of that is extremely hard for them. Um, but the people I've, I've seen who have become extraordinarily successful, and I've seen people from many, many different walks of life. A roommate I had, I really an apartment mate in San Francisco, became the burrito king of New York City. You know, it's, then the, I would not have anticipated this at all. Um, a Jewish guy who became the, the sort of the king of high quality Mexican food in, in New York. And um, intriguing. Um, Again, here's a guy who has a, a very, very strong future orientation, just like 50 Cent had a future orientation. Um, another you know, guy I went to school with is a um, very, very respected major venture capitalist out in Silicon Valley doing um, biotech and biomedical venture capital work. Uh, very, very significant work. And he was always intensely, intensely future-oriented. But I, I think there's a distinction between people who have a healthy and unhealthy relationship with the future. Uh, there are people who are so, they're so trapped in the future, in a sense, that they really can't enjoy the present. And these are these people who basically just work themselves to pieces from dawn till doom uh, with uh, n never really taking any pleasure in the present, never really engaging the present. And there are other people I see that have uh, very healthy, sane relationships with the present. And they can go into a, a very delightful expanded present, but they can also move into an extremely strategic future orientation. So there's this kind of relationship between present and future which is very healthy. And I think you can also have a healthy relationship with the past. I mean, ideally, a healthy mind will have a healthy relationship with all dimensions of time, but it's, it's what's motivating you. Um, perhaps people from, from very traditional cultures or honor-driven cultures are going to have this, this powerful pull toward the past because they're trying to um, d generate some kind of connection between the present and the past. They sort of see their role in life as maintaining this bridge between present and maybe the deep past. And so there you get situations where you, you get this you know, endless re referencing, endless referencing to the past like in the Balkans, for example. So I think there are, there are very, very many ways of an, an, being in relation with different points on the timeline. And it's, it's a very subtle and complex kind of experience that we can't just boil down to some simple little exercise. On an, another case I can give you is my brother, who is now dead. He died a couple of years ago, was severely mentally retarded. I mean, he was really severely mentally retarded. So basically, he, he came as close to first access as you could get. This guy, there was nothing for this guy but the present. He lived in the total present, nothing but the present. There was nothing else for him. There was nothing else possible for this guy. And uh, he was my brother. I grew up with him. So I modeled him unconsciously a lot growing up because we were fairly close in time.
And I learned a great deal about the inner state. I was able to enter into at will uh, very deeply into the state of a profoundly mentally retarded person. And it was really fascinating. It, it, it enriched my life in ways that I cannot possibly explain to you right now. This ability to be in his kind of expanded present. The expanded, and he lived in a very rich expanded present. And I have spent periods of my life in this very, very deep expanded present of the severely mentally retarded by choice as, as, a, as, a, as a wonderful and marvelous and inexplicable place to be. I could not possibly communicate that to you. But you might say the, the hypervigilant expanded present of, of the ghetto uh, and risky environments is, is another type of expanded present. So there's not just one kind of expanded present. There are many, many different types of expanded present, and there are many types of expanded future and contracted future. There, there, are, there are ways to be imprisoned in the future. There are ways to be imprisoned in the past. There are ways to be imprisoned in the present. And there are ways to be liberated in the future and liberated in the past and liberated in the present. So I think what we're really going with is, is how do you enter into a rich and liberating relationship with various points and various uh, traversing various um, regions of the timeline. So obviously timeline is going to become more complex. It's not something we can simply reduce down you know, to a quick little chapter or some um, taglines or something kind of you know clever and, and just kind of you know little formula. It's, it's much much more than that. It's really we're talking the basis of, of great novels and poetry and strategy and tremendous success and lack of success. So I think this is a really nice place for us to, to build a great deal of thinking on. So I guess that's going to be enough for this day. We've, we've hit uh, plenty of points and there's a lot to think about. <laughs>